Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening. Um, uh, on behalf of Chess, I'd like to welcome you to another session of Chess Webinar. I am George Shane from University of California, San Diego. Thank you for joining us today for another terrific conversation on the topic of robotic bronchoscopy. Before we begin, please note that during the webinar, the audience will be muted. However, uh, to ask questions or to communicate with the group during the webinar, please type them into the chat or question box. We'll keep track of the questions that they come up and address them toward the end of the session. Today's webinar is a result of appeal from clinicians for more information and background on the widely discussed topic of robotics. For the next 45 minutes, we will focus on the current available data and the implications of robotic bronchoscopy may have on your practice and then open up to a formal Q&A period. Uh, to examine the subject, uh, we're joined today by two very experienced pulmonologists who will share their experiences and their perspectives. Uh, my first guest today is Dr. Abubakar Bajwa from the Lung Institute at Ascension Medical Group, Jacksonville, Florida. He will review the early data on robotic bronchoscopy. Welcome. And my next guest is Dr. Glenn Bowder, who is the Director of Valley Intensivist and Valley Health Pulmonary Specialist and Director of Critical Care at Winchester Medical Center, uh, Winchester, Virginia. He will discuss the implication of robotic bronchoscopy on his practice uh, and welcome. So without further ado, Dr. Badra, please take it away. Thank you for having me. Real excited to talk about uh, bron robotic bronchoscopy and our early experience and the published data. So let's jump right in. So the objective of my portion of the presentation would be to talk a little bit about lung cancer and uh, the need for enhanced diagnostic techniques and why that uh, need exists. Uh, review some of the key published data briefly on the navigational bronchoscopy, variety of platforms and variety of results that have been published over the past uh, uh, many years, and then uh, talk about uh, uh, the recently presented uh, poster at ATS about uh, early outcomes uh, in our uh, single center experience and use of ion robotic bronchoscopy. We all know that lung cancer is the most common cancer worldwide and accounts for over 2 million cases and 1.8 million deaths and continues to be the leading uh, cancer uh, killer in both men and women uh, in the United States. There's estimated about 154,000 Americans to die from lung cancer in a year, approximately 25%, and it accounts for about 25% of all cancer related deaths. And the five year survival rate continues to be fairly dismal, although it has improved over time, but uh, lung and uh, bronchus related cancer is about 22% survival five years out. So why do we worry about trying to diagnose cancer as early as possible? Uh, the reason is the smaller uh, the cancer, the smaller the nodule at the time of diagnosis, the better the five year survival is. Uh, Lung cancer screening CT scans are fairly common and they're very good at picking up small nodules, uh, which may be early cancer. However, translating those early diagnoses of nodules to early diagnosis of cancer requires some sort of uh, diagnostic technique to confirm uh, malignancy. Uh, Obviously, there continues to be the guidelines that suggest that if there is a nodule that is small, early, and highly suspicious, you can go for resection without biopsy. But we all know that we have a lot of patients who cannot tolerate a surgical resection or even a wedge resection. In those cases, it becomes even more important to establish tissue diagnosis. You can see here early stage 1A and uh, 1A2, uh, which are typically T sizes, two centimeter or less, have a survival of 92% if they're less than a centimeter and 83% uh, if they're between one and two centimeters. And majority of the cancers that are diagnosed as part of lung cancer screening are small. About 65% account for stage 1A and 62% are peripheral nodules typically in the outer one third of the uh, view on the CT scan. So let's, let's start off with the, the 
Monarch robotic system, and I'm going to bring in all the rest of them too. So this is a 2020 study. It's called the benefit study. The idea was to look at feasibility and then look at the diagnostic yield as a secondary outcome. There are 54 patients. Uh, average lesion was about 23 millimeters, ranging from 31 to 50 uh, millimeter. At 22% were about 31 to 50 millimeter. 60% of those uh, uh, bronchoscopies noticed a radial EBA signal to be concentric. About 59% of those uh, who underwent the study had a positive bronchocyte. Uh, median generation count that was crossed during robotic bronchoscopy was 5.5%, and they had about 3.7% mean month Rx rate. So this was the early uh, uh, Monarch robotic system uh, feasibility and to some degree as a secondary endpoint diagnostic yield. Now, looking back in the previous years, in 2012, the meta-analysis uh, that was published uh, showed uh, using different uh, platforms, which included uh, their sheath guided bronchoscopy, ultra uh, bronchoscope, and navigational bronchoscopy. And they noticed that the diagnostic yield was about 61% for lesions that were two centimeter or less, so more than two centimeter, the lesion, uh, the diagnostic yield improved to 83%. Now, the acquire registry shows slightly different data. Uh, this was done subsequently in 2016, again, looking at various different uh, published data on navigational bronchoscopy, ultra thin use of radial EPAS. What they saw was that the lesion was two centimeter or less, the diagnostic yield was 47%, and over two centimeter it was 63%. That's a typo, actually should say 63% yield. Uh, this is all before uh, robotic uh, bronchoscopy systems uh, became available. Now, looking at uh, previously published data on Navigate study, when you're looking at the super dimension platform, uh, the diagnostic yield for lesions that were two centimeters or less, uh, and that study, one year results of that prospective trial showed a 67% yield for two centimeter or less, about 71% diagnostic yield for two centimeters or more. Uh, then uh, subsequent to the benefit study that was the Monarch Robotic System, there was a, a multi-center uh, experience that was published uh, in BMC Pulmonary, which looked at uh, diagnostic yield in a real world scenario. And what they noticed was if the lesion was less than a centimeter, diagnostic yield was 45.5%. And between one to three centimeters, the diagnostic yield was 68.5%. So if you look at the initial feasibility study for robotic system, the access to the nodule and ability to navigate to the nodule was tremendous improvement compared to the previous platforms. But the diagnostic yield uh, has not changed much. Uh, there is a precise study that is still not published, but uh, it was presented as an abstract last year in ATS, uh, which was using the ION robotic system. And what it showed was the feasibility again and diagnostic yield or ability to biopsy. So ability to reach a lesion and biopsy was about 96, I think it was 98%. But that data is not published yet. It was just the poster. The slide. So uh, we started uh, doing uh, robotic bronchoscopy in our system uh, somewhere around March, 2020, and we used the Intuitive's ION robotic system. And then we kept data, prospectively data on all the patients who were undergoing bronchoscopy and about somewhere about 75 cases, we decided to look back and review the uh, consecutive cases that were done by that time. Uh, all of the patients were done in the same community uh, tertiary care center between March 11th and November 25, and that accounted for about 76 patients. These are the baseline characteristics. Uh, majority of the patients were women, about uh, 54, 54%. Uh, age, obviously more elderly, 26%, 50 to 65, and 68% were over 65. Weight distribution was uh, fairly even between uh, mean BMI of about 28 and uh, somewhere between 39, or majority of the patients were on BMI of more than 25. If you look at the lesion size, 
Uh, most of the lesions were less than two, two centimeter, about 59 percent. Two to three centimeter uh, lesions accounted for about 33 percent of the cases, and there were a few lesions that were more than three centimeter. The distribution, as far as location of these nodules, obviously both upper lobes were the most common. Left upper lobe 34 percent, right upper lobe 28 uh, percent. Most of these had a solid appearance. There were about six or 7% uh, that had a ground glass appearance. Some of them had mixed density and a cavitary lesion was only one of those. Uh, we looked at the procedure duration, uh, meaning a patient arriving into the uh, uh, bronchoscopy suite and leaving the bronchoscopy suite based on uh, anesthesia documentation. And uh, we noticed that the median uh, time was about 58 minutes and ranged about 23 minutes to 102 minutes. Uh, radial EBUS was utilized in all cases, and we were able to get a concentric view in about 46% of the cases, a centric view in about 30%, and no uh, radial EBUS signal in about 24% of the cases. When we looked at the diagnostic yield, and I'll talk about what is a uh, diagnostic yield mean. So a diagnostic yield uh, was a specific diagnosis on the final pathology. Every case had rapid onsite evaluation with the exception of a few, but we waited until the final pathology was available. Malignancy was obviously a malignancy. Uh, pure atypical cells without any suspicion of a malignancy attached to the diagnosis was considered a non-diagnostic. A specific inflammatory lesion such as granulomatous or non-caseating granulomas uh, identification of fungal forms uh, uh, was considered a specific inflammation diagnosis and inflammation. We didn't label it as complete uh, as a diagnosis until we followed up and saw that there was resolution of those lesions. So having said that, less than two centimeter nodules, which were about 45 cases, had a diagnostic yield of 90%. Uh, nodules between two to three centimeter, 96%, and anything over three centimeters, 100% diagnostic yield. Uh, regardless of the location of the nodule, uh, the diagnostic yield uh, was fairly good. 86% of the right upper lobe rest of the uh, locations had over 90% diagnostic yield. Uh, regardless of its appearance, whether it was cavitary, remember this is just one lesion, mixed density, ground glass, or solid, the diagnostic yield held up quite uh, uh, quite a bit over 90%. Overall diagnostic yield was 92%, 59% of which were malignancy, inflammatory lesions accounted for 29% of those cases, benign non-inflammatory lesions such as hematomas and some benign tumors accounted for 4%. Uh, the non-diagnostic rate was 8%. So like I said, the inflammatory lesions uh, that we encountered were at the abscesses, cryptococcus infection, aspergillus infection, organizing pneumonia, granulomas. Now, when we followed these inflammatory lesions anywhere from between a duration of uh, six weeks to 18 weeks out, uh, what we saw was that 91% of the uh, lesions showed resolution or improvement at the time of the study. Subsequently, that data held up too. As an update to that, uh, I just wanted to show you a few uh, examples. For example, this was a small uh, seven millimeter uh, solid looking nodule in superior segment of the right lower lobe. Uh, as Although it was small, it was fairly positive on PET scan. Uh, because of our marginal lung functions, we, were, uh, we decided to get a tissue diagnosis. And uh, this in the lower right hand corner where you see the ultrasound, you can see an eccentric view of the lesion, not a very good view. Nonetheless, we were able to achieve a diagnosis from a biopsy. This would be an example of a ground glass lesion. You can see it's plural based on the lateral and it's kind of posterior plural based uh, with some cavitary areas within this. It was about 14 millimeters. This is a lesion obviously where you did not, uh, do not expect to get a radial EBA signal and we did not. Uh, however, we were able to get to the lesion and uh, diagnose it with biopsy and the uh, FNA and it was uh, an adenocarcinoma with lymphatic features. Uh, this would be an example of a difficult location solid lesion and uh, right next to the heart border, a uh, small nodule. Uh, there was some confusion about a liver lesion, whether this was linked or not. Uh, we were able to get to the lesion. We got a good uh, solid looking uh, radial EBA signal safely were able to biopsy it and it was a carcinoid 
uh, and not related to the liver lesion apparently that we were worried about. So this is just a slight uh, overview and I'm sure Dr. Bowder will go over in more detail about how the equipment works and uh, all the other details, but we know uh, that as we're doing lung cancer screenings, we're diagnosing smaller and smaller nodules. The question for us is, can we translate, uh, trans, uh, translate those diagnoses of nodules into diagnosis of lung cancer where it really matters? Although the diagnostic yields have improved over the years across different platforms, there's still a lot left to be desired. In our experience with the ion robotic system, I think our yield held up a probably fairly close to the choir registry, where, which had a diagnostic yield of 63% for lesions over two centimeter prior to initiation of our robotic system, which has improved it to over 90%. To date, we've done about 160 cases and the diagnostic yield is holding up fairly well. Uh, there is significant advantages of the robotic system, which includes stability of the system, the reach of the system and the reliability of the system. Uh, in our study, Ion Robotics Assisted Platform has shown really promising results uh, and that those results have continued to hold up uh, beyond the first 76 consecutive cases as we presented in APS abstract. Um, with this, I think I'll conclude my part of the presentation. I think uh, Dr. Bowder uh, can uh, continue on from here. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks uh, thanks for joining us, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Bajwa, for a wonderful presentation, uh, I, and hopefully I can add to that. Uh, I thought we'd just start uh, talking about, you know, what is, what is the real challenge and talk about the role of robotic-assisted bronchoscopy and cheating that goal, and you can see from Dr. Bajwa's data that uh, uh, certainly uh, we're, we're moving in that direction. And then I'll sprinkle in some of our early experience uh, and case examples and some of the exciting things that are happening re relative to uh, robotic bronchoscopy. And then we probably should also, you know, talk about are there limitations and are there opportunities as we, uh, as we move ahead. So what, 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 is, our, what is the challenge? And, and Dr. Bajwa noted that, there, you know, there's a high mo mortality with lung cancer relative and relative to any other lung, any other uh, cancers out there. And so we wanna detect these early, be able to create an early stage diagnosis, which allows uh, for improved survival. And it's that early stage diagnosis that, that really has been a challenge for us as pulmonologists in, in the bronchoscopy world. Uh, as you know, we've been historically poor at, at, at diagnosing early stage cancers, perif particularly peripheral lesions. And so how does, how does robotic bronchoscopy help us achieve that goal? Well, really, we're talking about being able to, to improve our diagnostic yield on all these lesions, be able to reach all areas of the lung, and achieve a low complication rate, uh, which uh, is an important factor in terms of our, our patient care. So do robots really help with early diagnosis? And, and I think there's, if you think about it, two major contributions. One is the scope size, right? Uh, smaller is better in terms of being able to get out to those smaller airways in the lung but also the flexibility and steering capability. And I would add vision on here as well too. Uh, for those of you who have used uh, other, robot, over, other navigational technology, we have done a lot of super dimension. Uh, being able to see where you're going and get into those smaller airways and those angles is certainly an improvement uh, in technology in terms of our, our ability to steer out to, to lesions in the periphery. There are other factors and that uh, were alluded to earlier and that is you know, the user interface, the stability of the platform, and overall improving technology in terms of uh, the CT body divergence and the, the, the registration of the patient with the virtual image. And this is, uh, this is one of our early cases, and it's an exciting uh, time because we get to see things, and this is a lesion that's way up in the upper lobe that I may or may not have, have tried in the past, and certainly we were able to drive that the robotic bronchoscope and we use the ion platform as well. And uh, what's really, really fun is to be able to see things in the airway that we've never seen in the periphery of the lung. And you can see that when you, you drive up on a lesion and, 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 and uh, can see it in the airway, it makes it uh, fairly assured that we're gonna get a diagnosis. But the, the, the real truth is most lesions don't have any an, an endobronchial component. Many of these small 
lesions sit outside the airway or next to the airway, and we don't get to see them even though we can drive out to that area. And so then we rely on, on confirmatory other uh, imaging modalities, particularly radio EBIS, to confirm that we're in the lesion. You can see here we could easily get out to this lesion in the periphery, uh, but uh, couldn't see anything in the airway and got a nice radio EBIS confirmation, and that allows us then to uh, feel confident that we're in that right area. I thought I'd just share with you a, 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 a typical case to give you, for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to see uh, the robotic platform work. And this is a, a very typical lesion, a two and a half centimeter lesion that's out in the periphery of the lung. You can see that it looks like there's an airway going to it, but uh, as many of us have found, the, the lesions sit outside the airway, uh, creating a distorted airway and uh, not a, always a direct pathway. We then take that CAT scan and put it into the planning software. The, the planning software creates a virtual uh, reconstruction of the airway tree and, and then uh, creates a pathway to it. It also automatically then gives you the, the plural uh, reflections and plural linings and fissures so you know your distance to those areas and you don't wanna put your uh, biopsy instruments out too far. So I'm just gonna share with you this video. And so once we've done the planning software, then we have to link the patient in real time to the virtual platform. And so what we're doing is we're putting the scope into the, all the areas of the lung, the upper lobes and the lower lobes. And in this case, the shape sensing technology is telling us where the catheter is in, in the patient and then relating that to the virtual image that's been created in terms of the pathway. Once that's done and we're satisfied that, that we've got a good signal, then we wanna make sure that that virtual image matches up and aligns fairly well with the real image. And you can see here, as, as we get the, the, the Vision Pro cleared, that the, the, trifurcated, bifur, the trifurcated area here, is, it looks like it's aligned up pretty well, both in terms of distance and orientation uh, in the real time. And so then we then switch over to our navigation mode and we're able to then guide ourselves down following the pathway to the lesion. And you can see we're fairly easily going down and follow our pathway. One of the things that you'll see that occurs here is that uh, the airway pathway wants to go off to the left, but that airway, as we suspected on the CT scan plan, was squishing that uh, small peripheral airway. And you can see that the lesion here is beginning to appear, our target is beginning to appear. And so we're going to get that uh, catheter very close to the to the airway wall so we can drive our instruments through there. And then once we've got ourselves, we feel like we're pretty aligned, we're going to pull that vision probe back and we're going to see we're up against the airway like we like. And we also see a suggestion that there's a small airway that probably leads into that lesion uh, there. So the next step then will be to uh, remove the vision probe and advance our radio EBIS and confirm that we're actually in a lesion uh, with the uh, assistance of fluoroscopy. And you can see here uh, by putting the radio EBIS that we've got a nice concentric view uh, of, the, of the lesion, feeling which makes us confident that we're in the right spot. This is then followed by uh, removal of the radio EBIS and advancement of the uh, biopsy tools, the needle biopsy. We're getting samples and sending them off for rapid on-site evaluation. In the meantime, we're checking our position with the radio EBIS to make sure we're in good location. And then finally, once I get confirmation, in this particular case, uh, we went ahead and got some transbronchial biopsies to get larger pieces of tissue for our pathologists and also for our oncology colleagues if they wanted to do uh, additional marks or stains or a genetic uh, marker testing. So that is the basic fundamental uh, process of robotic bronchoscopy using the ion system. That's a pretty large lesion and you could make a case, well, I could probably get that by other methods and, and that's true. Once you've started to have success with this system, your colleagues will start to ask you to do lesions such as this. And Dr. Bajwa has showed some nice cases of some small lesions as well. And I guess the point is, is that these, these new the robotic systems have the capability of getting to lesions in places we typically would not be able to using the radio EBIS, being able to confirm uh, that we're in the lesion and get a diagnosis. And this was turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma. 
Um, what, as I pointed out earlier, one of the most, one of the more exciting things is, is seeing things that we've never seen before. And I, we were asked to biopsy this cavitary lesion. And when we got up to the lesion, there was a thin wall and aspirated through the lesion and didn't get much back. And I pushed the uh, scope a little bit further and we actually popped through this very thin wall. And as you can see here, we ended up on the inside of the cavity. Um, and then we were able to then do biopsies of that uh, mu mucinoid-like uh, cavity wall. And you can see where we, we were able to take biopsies here. And, and again, this is, this is just added bonus to, to understanding what these lesions look like and, and behave like uh, that we, we've not been able to do before. Uh, as Dr. Bajwa pointed out in his data and also confirmed by our data that not everything looks like a cancer is a cancer. This was a lesion in the airway and so most, as you, as you can see here, there's a significant amount of emphysema in this patient and certainly our interventional radiology colleagues were not interested in, in passing a needle percutaneously here. Uh, we got inflammatory condi uh, in cells on the rapid on site. And when we do that, we send off culture data. This grew out pseudomonas. Uh, he was treated with two weeks of antibiotics and you can see in three months later, there was complete resolution of the lesion. And so, uh, you know, the utility of this uh, beyond just looking for the cancer is, is, is tremendous at this point. So I'll just share with you a little bit of our experience. Our, our diagnostic yield criteria were very similar to what Dr. Bajwa noted. And we had in our first 66 cases, and this is all of our cases, including our kind of running cases that we were learning on, overall diagnostic yield of 83%, following up many of those uh, 88% that, that turned out to be uh, true negatives on, on pathology follow-up where they, the lesions resolved. But very interestingly, and similarly, a large percentage of our patients, 18% had non-cancer diagnoses. Uh, we had two patients that underwent bilateral procedures, uh, but when they, I only counted them as one case in our data. Uh, and as you can see here, very similar to his data, uh, either inflammatory, infectious, uh, non-cancerous lesions were, were the main uh, players in terms of what, what we found out of the, the, the cohort of our, our first 66 patients. Uh, just a couple of comments about some other things relative to um, this technology. Uh, imaging adjuncts are, are essential. As you do smaller and smaller lesions, they get more and more difficult to see under uh, fluoroscopy. Uh, and the radioebus is really an essential tool in identifying, making sure you're in the right uh, uh, location. Uh, a lot of interest, and, and Mike Pritchett's done a lot of, and others have done a lot of work around cone beam technology and certainly uh, may play a role uh, particularly in the smaller lesions where you can identify, and this is just a, a rendition of, of some cone beam images where you can identify the tool in the lesion, and this may uh, play an important role going forward. Uh, and then just as a, as a reminder, uh, you know, we, we, we do do other things, um, fiducial marker placement. Uh, I've engaged our uh, thoracic surgeon in doing some operative markings. So we've taken the robot down to the operating room and this is a very small but growing ground glass opacity in a, in a smoker uh, who was adamant that it needed to come out. We went ahead and put ICG dye in uh, using the robotic technology. You can see very easily get out to the pleura. You can see this little mark that we got out onto the, onto the chest wall. Uh, this provided her a pathway to, to wedge this out. Uh, and make sure it was a cancer before she did a, 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 a completion lobectomy. So uh, a lot of utility for this and, and a lot of opportunity. And obviously a, a, in the future, a discussion about whether we are being able to do uh, advanced treatment catheters. So it, every technology has its limitations and we, we should acknowledge that. Uh, we, I've had one occasion where the patient's airways were just so small that we couldn't advance the scope uh, far enough out to the periphery, but that was in one case. And some of these, some of the angles that you encounter, most of them can be overcome, but occasionally there is a, some angulation challenges. Um, there's the, the technology is the technology, right? And it's only as good as the software imaging capability. We still have challenges around spatial orientation. The radio EVIS probe does not give us a spatial relationship very well. And so that's a, that's a challenge. And then there's, you know, there's operator dependency with, we still have to contend with CT body divergence in, 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 in our, uh, in our work. 
And then also, you know, think about we we still have the same tools that we've been using for many, many years. And are, are, is there new advances in tools that may help us advance this technology even further? So, so as we think about robotic bronchoscopy, clearly we're improving our diagnostic yield over other platforms that we've had in the past. Um, and, and really that's around our being able to see our way out to the lesion and the size of the catheters getting out there pretty far. Um, the great thing about this for our patients now, we can combine both diagnosis and mediastinal staging in one procedure. Many of us have seen through the years that the interventional radiologists needle a perf peripheral lesion and then they have a lymphadenopathy that needs to be biopsied and the patients have to go through two procedures. So certainly an advantage of there. Um, I think that you're gonna see an expanded role for this in, in non-cancer diagnoses. Um, if we have this technology to accurately biopsy um, ground glass opacities or persistent infiltrates with a degree higher degree of accuracy and, uh, and diagnostic capability, we probably should be doing that. Um, and we talked a little bit about the limitations. I, I will say one other thing is from a user experience, having done a lot of cases with super dimension uh, in the past that the mechanics of use and my shoulder feel much better as a result of uh, this technology. Uh, for those of you who have done a lot of these cases, know what I'm talking about. So I'll uh, I'll pause there. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Boulder, uh, Dr. Boulder, it's a um, it's it's interesting because um, you know the. Uh, it, it seems like the robotic bronchoscopy program that you're building is, uh, uh, had a tremendous impact on your practice. But a lot of times, you know, um, uh, one of the things that a lot of people come and ask us is um, how, how do you even start? How do you even start a program? How do you even approach your, uh, um, your administration to discuss uh, this uh, large investment? Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, thank, thanks for asking. And uh, uh, I, I did put a few slides together in case we that topic was available to us. Um, and, you know, let's, let's start with getting started, right? Um, uh, many, some of my colleagues said, oh, Dr. Bowder just wants a new toy uh, in his bronchoscopy suite. Uh, but really, what, what is our goal? And, and, and thinking about that to begin with, are you breaking into the navigation space? Um, do, you have lim do you have a navigation platform that you're unhappy with and you want to improve your diagnostic yield? Is it just, is it part of your larger lung cancer multidisciplinary program that you want to add this on to? Is it a marketing toy? Uh, hopefully not just that, but, but I mean, really think about why, why you want to do this and, and why is it important uh, for your patients? So uh, one of the things we started out with is, you know, where are we with our current platform? And, and really, what are the perceived limitations? And before we tried to fix our diagnostic yield, if you would, or, or our complication rates uh, with a new technology, were there other issues that, that were holding us back? Was, was your pathologist always giving you a, a, a atypical cells and never a diagnosis and you weren't, weren't, weren't completing things the way you should? Um, did you not have other imaging capabilities like Rebus to help you? And so, um, so I think thinking hard about your existing program and where the challenges are and will this technology really improve things is important uh, and how, how the robotic platforms are different and what you'll do. So, and then also you need to think about, uh, do you need upgrader imaging capability? Do you need a new fluoro unit? Um, are you gonna go all the way and ask for a cone beam? Are there other imaging adjuncts that you, you think you might need to help you uh, achieve your goals? So, and then, uh, you know, just a comparison of the two robotic systems, thinking about thinking about all of those factors, uh, what are the differences between these two? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? The Monarch system, as, as was pointed out, is works off an electromagnetic platform, the ION system using a shape sensing technology platform. Uh, probably the biggest difference between the two is, is the fact that the, the Monarch has, system has a has two independent channels. And so the, the, vision pro, the vision as well as the working channel are separated, unlike the ion, which has a, 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 a optics catheter, which is removable, uh, which then becomes the working channel. And, and that results in a, in a difference in the outside diameter of the catheter, um, 4.4 versus 
uh, 3.5 millimeters. And, I, and so those are, the, those are the fundamental differences between those two systems. You can see they both have a, a degree of flexibility that we've never been able to achieve before uh, with our uh, traditional bronchoscopes. And then, you know, how does each system achieve your goal? Make your pros and cons list. How does it improve on what you're doing now? Again, I would encourage you to go out and, and try them out. Um, there's enough of both of these systems out there these days that you can go out and talk to and visit or listen to someone who's, uh, who's using each of those systems and, and, and make your decision based on that. Um, as you think about this then, uh, we are unaccustomed as pulmonologists to asking for big ticket items. And so uh, a little bit of thought process and how you're going to talk with administrators around the importance of, of adding this technology to your uh, armamentarium, if you would. How, does it increase your number of procedures? Does it integrate into your larger program? Are there decreased complication costs? And clearly there are relative to percutaneous needle aspirate. Um, and how does all that uh, play into the bus business case for that? And then finally, one of the strongest things you can do is get your colleagues to support you. Uh, one, of the, one of the strengths of our program has been a, a very strong collaboration with our thoracic surgery colleague. And so having them on board and, and, and supporting you is important as well as your oncology and, and, your, and your interventional radiologist, because ultimately uh, you may be uh, moving cases from their, from their bucket into yours, uh, which may create some challenges for you uh, with your local politics. One of the other things just to think about in advance, once you've kind of taken that step is credentialing. Who gets to perform these? Is it just an extension of your bronc privileges? Uh, do you have to have previous navigational experience? Is it only for people that are IP trained? Uh, things to think about as you move forward. Uh, talk with your credentials committee. Most of the time they have a process to bring in new procedures. Uh, they have templates regarding that and robotic surgery was a good template for uh, uh, for, for us to use as we created a credentialing platform. Uh, there's the manufacturer mandated training, there's mentored cases, yearly minimum. I, I would say though that um, like other specialties, I think that you don't want 10 people doing three procedures a year. Uh, there is a level of, of expertise that is gained by doing uh, procedural volume. And so you probably want to start with one or two people doing this uh, at least 30 or 40 cases a year to get uh, I think the best outcomes that you're trying to achieve because ultimately we're trying to get to a better diagnostic yield and earlier diagnosis for patients with lung cancer. So uh, you probably, if you have a robust program, you probably already have a team. Um, our team was, was a little bit anxious about the new technology. I was a little bit surprised because we, we, we do a lot of things, but uh, I would encourage you to, to gain, engage all those that are gonna be helping you uh, we have an anesthesia protocol, so we had our anesthesiologist uh, heavily engaged. One of the things that we didn't do well was get sterile processing involved. The sterile, the processing of these scopes was slightly different from what we did before. That set me back about three weeks from our start date as the infection control people marched down and said, you're not going to do it that way. Uh, so uh, learn, you can learn from my mistake there. Um, and then afterwards, debrief your first couple of cases or anyone, any difficult ones after. We learned a lot by just uh, our workflow by, uh, by debriefing our cases and, and what, was, what was concerning for those people that were watching from the outside of, uh, of the room or within the room and uh, watching from the side. Um, the other thing was, this is yet another piece of equipment in a crowded space. We're very lucky that we have an old cardiac catheterization lab. Uh, the downside of that is that we have a large fixed fluoroscopy unit and a fixed table. And so things have to surround that and bringing the robot in was just one more added uh, piece to that puzzle. And so we had a couple of different iterations of the room uh, before we pushed the anesthesiologist back into the corner. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had everything where we needed to. Um, just a couple of comments, co a common question as we get started a lot of people said, do you, do you need previous navigational experience? And I, and I think ultimately you probably don't. Um, certainly the registration and navigational mechanics are pretty user-friendly and I think quickly uh, mastered. Um, I do think that uh, having it helps because the sp particularly the spatial relations of the catheter and the lesion and using the tools and all of that, is, it, it certainly gives you a leg up in, in, in getting started. But uh, ultimately, it's, it's new for everyone, and, and ultimately, each of us have a slightly different learning curve. And finally, 
just a few other things to think about data collection. Um, I made the mistake uh, of, of being very excited about doing my cases and, and forgot to forgot to chronicle my first 10 or 15 and had, having to go back and dig through that. So think about how you're going to do that, who's going to do that, how you're going to define your diagnostic yield, what's your break point, is it zero to two centimeters, three or more, uh, and then how do non-cancer uh, procedures fit into your data. Uh, and just think about that up front that helps you down the line. And finally, marketing. Are you going to market this to your to your regional? And then I would also finally encourage you to make sure you follow up your, your colleagues who supported uh, bringing this uh, new technology on board. So just to kind of wrap up, and that's a, that's a, a large uh, discussion point about getting started, but I, I do think it, this is a remarkable time for us as pulmonologists and and. And this new technology is is really going to, I think, take off and incorporate into our standard care processes, much like EBIS has become a, a standard uh, technology. Um, it's going to continue to refine, and I think adjunctive imaging is going to continue to improve our, our accuracy. And the promise of, of catheter-based therapy, I believe, is, is, is on the horizon as we uh, uh, use this more and more. So I will... Uh, I will stop there and uh, I want to just thank everyone for your attention and our, my opportunity to be here today. Great. That was fantastic. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Balder uh, and um, uh, Dr. Bajwa. Um, uh, you know, there, um, uh, there are uh, several questions that are coming through from the, uh, uh, from the audience. Um, and as a start, maybe we can just start delving into a couple of questions that I, uh, I have, and I think it may, may actually address some of the uh, questions that are, um, are being asked. Um, one of the questions um, that come through is, um, you know, the utility of the existing um, platforms that we have. So, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, what is the utility of the radio EBIS? What is the utility of fluoroscopy uh, during the robotic bronchoscopy? Uh, and uh, also, of course, also, uh, um, do you feel like you need rows uh, for, uh, for your cases or is it procedural dependent? Uh, can you guys comment on this? I'll have a go at it first. Um, so, yes, uh, the answer to the first uh, question, whether you need uh, uh, something supplemental like the fluoroscopy and radial EBUS. The, the answer to that is, uh, unless you absolutely have no access to, to these tools, but I think the majority of the places that have navigational systems should have a C-arm available, and radial e-bus is pretty cheap. If you're doing already e-buses, incorporating radial e-bus probe into that is fairly cheap also. I would start, strongly recommend that you have at least these two, because these are traditional bronchoscopy-related tools uh, that are that should be available uh, to help you. Now, do you need it uh, for each and every case? Uh, you know, at least uh, we know for all pulmonologists, we, we have some uh, degree of comfort when we see a C-arm in the room, and uh, especially when you're trying to reach and biopsy these peripheral small nodules, although C-arm is not 100% guaranteed that your needle's not going to be sticking out of the chest, but at least it gives you that little peace of mind that you're in the right area and you know how close to the edge you are if you maneuver the C-arm into a right position. Short answer is yes, but you should have a C-arm and a radial EBUS when you're doing robotic bronchoscopy. I have missed the second part. Yeah, so uh, the second part is what, what about um, a ROSE, use of ROSE, um, oh. right on site? Yeah, we try to use it. Is it helpful? Uh, sometimes I would say. So there are plenty of times that the, the pathologist is unable to give you an answer except that they see a lot of blood and it's hard for them to find anything on the spot within that blood. Uh, so I think uh, that if you have the ability uh, to have a pathologist right there, yes. If you don't, then I wouldn't sweat it. There, were plenty, there are plenty of times when I don't call them uh, because I know a lesion is small and uh, I won't get an answer uh, on the spot, so or the time is done, you know, at 3 34 o'clock in the afternoon, they're not available or they're wrapping up, you can't get them. So, I, I don't think you have to have rapid on site, I don't think it enhances anything. It is good to have them, uh, if you have the ability to get them there. Uh, Dr. Balder, how are you? What are your thoughts? 
Well, I I, uh, I would uh, agree with Dr. Boswell. I think that uh, I, I see the radio EBIS is, is pretty invaluable. And, and, and particularly if you don't have rapid on site to, to help you with your confidence that you're, you're in the right location and lesion and, and lesion. So, uh, and I, I, I'm fairly, uh, I'm probably a little obsessed with it because I, even in between needle passes, particularly in smaller lesions, I like to look and make sure things haven't moved and I'm still in the right position. So I, it, it improves my confidence tremendously. The rapid on site piece uh, certainly is an enhancement, but it can prolong your case. Uh, as, as you guys pointed out, the, uh, you know, you get blood, you don't get an answer and you think you're in the lesion, you think you, it's a cancer and you want to keep going. And as it turns out, it's, it's just prolonged your case for not an additional yield. So I, I, would, I would concur with both of the things that you said with those additional comments. So, um, you know, I think one, one of you, if not both of you mentioned about uh, uh, use of fluoroscopy or, for, or uh, other real-time imaging modalities that, are, uh, uh, that helps with uh, uh, localization of the small nodules. Um, tell us about what, do you, what are some of the technology that you use in your practice? Um, uh, last time Dr. Bajwa started, this time I'll uh, ask Dr. Boulder to give a shot. Thanks. Um, I, I, I have to say that uh, 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 listening to my colleagues who have used cone beam that I, I had a heightened interest and we have a cone beam in our vascular surgery lab and I was allowed to do a, a, a case or two there and, and certainly uh, it was a bit of a feasibility study and certainly it's pretty remarkable to see your tool in the lesion and, and feel very confident in that. Um, having said that, you know, the vast majority of the cases using the other modalities that we said uh, accomplish the goals that we need to. And so it's not, not needed for everyone. And, and that's a huge institutional investment. There are some other uh, modalities that are out there. The Cyospin, for example, is a, is a portable uh, uh, unit that, that we, we tried out a, a couple of weeks ago. And again, it, it gives you that tool and lesion. And I think it probably it's gonna enhance, enhance our ability to get smaller lesions but I don't think it's the end all be all for everything that for every one of these cases. Dr. Bajwa, um, comments on the, your, yeah. your. So I think uh, uh, the, for me, let me tell you my experience and then I will tell you what you should do probably. Uh, I don't use any of those uh, uh, advanced uh, imaging uh, uh, like a cone beam CT. Uh, we have it available. I have the option to use the room because now we've built a new hybrid cath lab, so that room is abandoned with the cone beam CT. I don't use it because I've never felt the need for it up to the up to now. Uh, even uh, after 150 plus cases, I don't feel like it added much to it. Now, uh, we also have a mobile uh, OCT scan. It's called Aero CT that you can use, and I have used that in a few cases purely to just get an idea of. Hopefully, when the ablation studies come along, can is that feasible or not? Because I don't really hate going to the OR. That means you got to put on scrubs or something like that to get in there. I'd rather just go to my Bronx lab and do it there. Now, in the cases that I've used, in those three cases that I just looked at the feasibility and flow of things to see if I could do it. Uh, when I navigated to the lesion and the system, uh, the ion robotic system told me I'm right there in front of the lesion. When I did the CT scan, I did not have to make any significant adjustments uh, because the, the, the catheter was pointing right at the lesion. So I don't feel, I didn't feel like, okay, oh my God, I should have used it in the previous cases. Now, if you're starting a new program, um, you should not ask for these adjuncts because CRM is available everywhere. Uh, it is going to be very difficult for you to convince anybody to get you another, uh, you know, five hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment to supplement your new robotic system for bronchoscopy. That's just not going to happen. Uh, so I think, having said that, you can be fairly sure that uh, with the regular CRM radial e bus and this system, your yield is going to be good. You don't need those absolutely unless you have ones laying around like we did a couple of them for in our case. Agreed. Um, so uh, uh, so a couple of other questions that came through um, um, and, and I'm gonna divide this into two parts. One part is um, uh, comparing over conventional bronchoscopy. 
Um, what are some of the changes that you see uh, using robotic bronchoscopy for the access to peripheral nodules? Um, uh, what are uh, any, um, any workflow changes, any timing in terms of the time, extended time of the procedure uh, differences that you perceive? Uh, obviously the yield is dramatically different, but um, if you guys can comment on your workflow and comparing specifically to conventional bronchoscopy, please. Dr. Bajo? Yeah, I'll go first. So um, I, I assume when you say conventional bronchoscopy, maybe they're also saying conventional navigational uh, bronchoscopy in the previous. Uh, uh, ultrasing, I think uh, uh, um, more of the ultra thin uh, bronchoscope that's out there. It's a one that's uh, uh, have a 1.7 working channel. Right. So for us, I mean, uh, obviously, once your team has settled with the flow of things, the setup is, you know, when I walk in, uh, it's just we're waiting for anesthesia to intubate the patient. Yes, we do have, use NO anesthesia for each and every case. Yes, each patient, unless contraindicated, is uh, uh, chemically paralyzed. And then we use a little bit of PEEP, uh, usually around 10 of PEEP with each case. Now, does it take any longer? No, it actually is much faster because you're not uh, going in an airway, coming back out and trying a different airway and then coming back out and trying a third generation or a different split in the airway to try to go find the nodule because the, you have the navigation guiding you. Nine out of 10 times when it guides you, it guides you perfectly and you're right there and you put your radial ultrasound out there and you find the lesion. Uh, I, I think that that's, that's much quicker. So and by now, at this point, about 10, 15 minutes in the case, you have a needle in a, a lesion and you're doing sampling uh, from the start. Now, that includes a re just regular sweep and inspection bronchoscopy before you connect the robot and do your stuff. Uh, so it's much quicker, in my opinion, compared to traditional bronchoscopy. I would, I would echo that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, the anesthesia piece tends to add a little bit longer on in the, in the beginning of the case than we're, than we're used, used to, particularly if you're just doing moderate sedation. But most of these cases, you know, or all these cases are under general anesthesia. Um, so that adds time. But uh, the, the time to, to do your airway exam and, and, and get out to the lesion very easily and accurately, uh, again, nine times out of 10, it, it saves you time. You can, you can do, you know, diagnose and come back and do EBIS. Uh, and, and a couple of nodes, uh, per, you know, within 30 minutes, uh, 30 to 40 minutes, very easily. Now, same question. Um, uh, uh, except now, instead of a conventional bronchoscopy, what, um, comparing to what you used to use um, for peripheral access, um, can you comment on uh, your experience in terms of changing over to uh, um, robotic bronchoscopy for uh, your navigation uh, and needs? Uh, Dr. Baldwin? So uh, we were a super dimension shop. I think we did, I don't know, 350 or so cases. Um, and I would say our ability to navigate out to the lesion is quicker. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the trueness of, the, of the, uh, the needle or the biopsy forceps coming out of the end of the catheter is, is, is what you would expect. Uh, as for those of you who have used super dimension, it's the flexible tipped catheter with different angles. And so you have to kind of, you'd have to kind of allow for the straightening of the catheter, so to speak. Um, and, and then, you know, just the feel of being able to, other than feeling your way through the airway rather than seeing your way through the airway. So I think for all those reasons, um, it's quicker and uh, much more accurate. Um, and then as, as I alluded to in, in part of my talk, I'll, I'll emphasize again, my shoulder feels a lot better uh, being able to, to, to let go of the controls and have everything stay in place uh, in between all, all of the works that we're doing. So, Dr. Badra. Yeah, so we used uh, the Varen system prior to acquiring this system. And even before, it, we've had the Varen system for a while. And before that, I used to use Super D. Uh, and, and it is night and day for me, at least. Uh, there, there's no comparison. Uh, it felt almost now it feels like what we were doing in the past was riding your luck and hoping that, you know, you take them, just take the right turn to get into it. And it was just pure luck. And it really, it was based on our diagnostic yields uh, on the previous systems. Now, those systems are fine for bigger lesions. If you want to use them like a three, four centimeter peripheral lesion, if there's nothing else available, uh, yeah, I mean, those are fine. Uh, but for us, they, have, they really have no utility. 
in our practice anymore to a point we've sent actually sent our system to our peripheral uh, facilities uh, to be used there. Uh, now, um, the other thing what, we, what I've noticed is uh, that there is very little uh, airway trauma uh, when we're using the robotic system. For some strange reason, I mean, you feel like you're traveling through these small airways, but when you're done with the procedure and you back out, you don't see any scratches, any of those bruises and uh, fatigue that you usually cause with a traditional scope that results in bleeding and patients subsequently coughing their brains out. So the, I, I don't see that. It's very remarkable. I don't know why that happens. It's just the type of the catheter and the way it moves and glides through the airways. Uh, I hope that answers it. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, the uh, one of the question that came up is, um, uh, you know, how many uh, how many generation of airways can you go out there from uh, your experience? I mean, um, <laughs> I, it seems like one, some of the images, some of the cases that you show, there are tiny nodules all the way out into the outer third. I, it's just, do you count <laughs> do you <have> thoughts? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Doctor Bowder, you want to take a shot at this? I answered the last question first. Maybe. Sure, I, I, I don't count, um, uh, <laughs> uh, but I am amazed because I keep pushing and pushing and pushing and, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to be on the pleural surface very quickly. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, the peripheral airways tend to be fairly distensible and, and, and as Dr. Bajra pointed out, the, the catheter just kind of glides out there and, and um, uh, I, I think you can, you can pretty much push it almost to the pleural surface, I think, uh, very easily and without any difficulty. And if you look at the radio force uh, meter on the on the on the uh, ion robot, it it doesn't record excessive forces going out there. So, uh, and I think that also allows us to kind of move uh, onto some lesions out there that, in the periphery that we otherwise couldn't get to. So, um. yeah, I would agree. I mean, you're you're very close to the floor. I think in some of the studies that were published, uh, I think it was precise that you were probably within the 10 millimeters of the pleura. And what I can tell you from a personal on the three pneumothorax off the 150 plus case that we've done. And one of the case, uh, shockingly enough, we could see the puncture side and they could see the uh, parietal pleura that looked like I was gliding. It was us gliding <laughs> when we put the vision <laughs> probe back. And so that's how close you can get once you cause an email, obviously the lung shrinks onto the scope. So your scope is now sticking out looking at the parietal pleura. Well, that was a small meme that resolved very quickly. Uh, but yeah, you can really get out there. You can be right on the edge of the lung. That's, as uh, far as generation, the computer system gives you how many generations you've crossed over. Five or six generations is not uncommon. Uh, but I, I think that's based on software because it does simplify the airway tree sometimes. So some generations are lost in that. Uh, but you, know, you can easily go through five or six splits in the airways before you're at the lesion, so that's not uncommon. Um, and uh, and I think that's, that's great. I think the, there's um, earlier there's a comment from Dr. Balder uh, uh, um, about um, uh, uh, two in catheter deflection problem in terms of the the, the robotic system really fixed the angulation, and we pass tools across, and you actually hit the target, and it doesn't deflect. Um, but then, uh, uh, Dr. Baldwin, you mentioned in your study that you use a peep of ten. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, and, uh, and, you know, I wonder why, why do you use a PIPA 10? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, is this, uh, is this usual care and why do you, uh, why do you intubate the patient? Why do you use PIPA 10? Are you trying to accomplish something, uh, to the physiolo physiology of the patient? Uh, right. So remember, uh, general anesthesia, that there's a lot of atelectasis that develops and generally anesthesiologists on their machine will not put a PEEP on the machine if you're doing cases with just conventional and that what results is a lot of atelectasis in the posterior part of that as those patients laying supine and that caused a lot of uh, diversion between your CT scan that you use for planning to actual uh, navigation. And we see that actually, we see even the few cases, like I mentioned when we did the CT scan to look at the feasibility, I was just profoundly shocked at how much atelectasis had developed after induction of anesthesia in those cases. And sometimes your nodule gets lost in that atelectasis and the periphery, especially if it's a peripheral nodule. So CT scan sometimes doesn't help because uh, the nodules within the atelectasis, especially if it's a small nodule. To overcome that part, uh, we, we always use PEEP of 10. Remember, now these CT scans that we've done that showed atelectasis actually were done on PEEP of 10 too. So some of these patients who were heavier, 
will develop that profound atelectasis despite PEEP attempt. So PEEP does help kind of maintain the airway anatomy that is the closest to your initial CT scan that you did for planning. Dr. Bauer, would you like to round us out? Yeah, we, uh, we have an anesthesia protocol. Um, I have people doing incentive spirometry while they're sitting around waiting to be next in line for their case to make sure they don't develop it just laying in bed. And we use a 10 of PEEP as well and a slightly higher tidal volume, usually 10 mLs per kilo. Again, just to try to prevent that atelectasis because it's that CT body divergence that can occur as a result of that atelectasis is impressive when it occurs uh, and not without uh, clinical consequence. Well, with that, everyone, um, we'd like to thank you uh, for your time uh, and sharing with us for the past uh, an hour. Um, and uh, we look forward to see you all in uh, this year's CHEST uh, meeting in Orlando in October. Uh, and again, thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. Badra, Dr. Boulder. Great. It's a great pleasure to see that you both are running a, such a successful program. And I hope uh, but we can uh, have more of our uh, fellow pulmonologists across the uh, United States to join your, uh, join your ranks. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Take